Let's stand for our scripture lesson this evening. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're looking at verses 14 through 18. Word of God. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the the wisdom of those who gone before us. We thank you that you have let us have some of these messages, and we ask, Lord, that you'll bless these particular words, and that they can be meaningful to people, and help them in their lives to come. In Jesus' name, amen. George Whitfield lived from 1714 through 1770. Uh, this particular sermon is one that I have updated the language for, including the Bible translation. I've gone to the English Standard Version, as well as um, some of the other language, and it's been abridged somewhat as well. Isaiah, speaking of the glory of gospel days, said, From old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you, who acts for those who wait for him. That's chapter 64, verse 4. Could a world lying in the wicked one really be convinced of this? They would need no other motive to induce them to renounce themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus Christ. And if believers had this truth always deeply impressed upon their souls, they would abstain from every evil, be continually aspiring after every good, and use all diligence to walk worthy of him who has called them to his kingdom and glory. If I'm not mistaken, that is the end intended by the Apostle Paul in the words of the text, we are the temple of the living God. These words, originally directed to the church of Corinth, equally belong to us and to our children and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. First, I shall endeavor to give you the meaning of these words. We are the temple of the living God. The expression is undoubtedly metaphorical, but under the metaphor, something real and of infinite importance is to be understood. These words seem to point not only towards what we call temples or churches in general, but to the Jewish temple in particular. I trust that most of you know that the preparations for this edifice were exceedingly grand and that it was modeled and built by a divine order. When completed, the temple was separated from common use and dedicated to the service of the incomprehensible Jehovah with the utmost solemnity. It is also by a divine order that Christians become the temple of the living God, of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They who once held a consultation to create are all equally concerned in making preparations for and effectually bringing about the redemption of man. The Father creates, the Son redeems, and the Holy Spirit sanctifies all the elect people of God. Being loved from eternity, they are effectually called in time, they are chosen out of the world, and by a free, voluntary, unconstrained oblation, they devote themselves, spirit, soul, and body, to the service of Him who has loved them and given Himself for them. This is true and undefiled religion before God, our Heavenly Father. This is the Christian's reasonable service, the service required of us in the Word of God. It implies no less than a total renunciation of the world. It turns the Christian's whole life 
into one continued sacrifice of love to God, so that whether he eats or drinks, he does all to the glory of God. Now, I do not mean that as Christians, in order to be temples of the living God, we must become hermits or shut ourselves up in nunneries or cloisters. No, the religion which the Bible prescribes is a social religion, a religion equally practicable by high and low, rich and poor, and which absolutely requires a full commitment to serving God in whatever state of life he should be pleased to place and continue us. There are some who literally separate themselves from the world and lives of solitude out of a sincere desire to save their souls and attain higher degrees of Christian perfection. But such a zeal is in no way according to knowledge. For individual Christians are said to be the salt of the earth and the lights of the world and are commanded to let their light shine before man. How can this be done if we shut ourselves up and thereby exclude ourselves from all manner of interaction with the world? Indeed, if we fly to the most distant and desolate parts of the earth, would not a wicked heart and a wicked tempter pursue us there? Rather than getting ease and comfort in our isolation, I believe that we should, on the contrary, soon experience the truth in what a hermit once said to me, that a tree that stands by itself is most exposed to the strongest blasts. When our Savior was to be tempted by the devil, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So then, to be a Christian is to be in the world and yet not of it. To have our hands employed on earth according to our respective stations in life and our hearts at the same time fixed on things above. Then indeed we are temples of the living God. With a humble boldness we can then say that we are the, in the same, in the, we are the same in the parlor as we are in the closet. At night we can throw off our cares and being at peace with the world, ourselves, and God, indifferent as to whether we sleep or die. Furthermore, the Jewish temple was a house of prayer. My house, says the great God, shall be called a house of prayer. For this end was the temple built and adorned with furniture. Solomon, in that admirable prayer, which he put up to God at the dedication of the temple, said, And listen to the pleas of your servant, and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. What was said of the first temple, our Lord applies to the second temple. My house shall be called a house of prayer. On this account also true believers may be called the temple of the living God. For, being wholly devoted and dedicated to God, their hearts become the seats of prayer, offering a perpetual sacrifice of prayer and praise to the Father of mercies, the God of all consolations. Those, and only those, who thus worship God in the temple of their hearts can truly be called a royal priesthood. Those, and only those, can truly be called the temple of the living God. Because only those worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let no one say that such a devotion is impracticable or only practicable by a few who have nothing to do with the common affairs of life. For this is the common duty and privilege of all true Christians. To pray without ceasing and to rejoice in the Lord always are precepts required of all who name the name of Christ. And though it is hard for persons that are immersed in the world to serve the Lord without distraction, and though the lamp of devotion, even in the best of saints, sometimes burns too dimly, Yet those who are the temple of the living God find prayer to be their very element. And once those who believe this to be difficult come to love prayer, as some unhappy men love swearing, they will find no more difficulty in praying to and praising God always than those unhappy creatures do in cursing and swearing always. My brethren, the love of God is all in all. When we truly believe this, meditation, prayer, praise, and other spiritual exercises become habitual and delightful. The Jewish temple was also a place where the great Jehovah was pleased in a more immediate manner, manner to reside. Hence, he had said to record his name there and to sit or dwell between the cherubim 
and when Solomon first dedicated it, we are told, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. And why this amazing manifestation of the divine glory? Even for this, O oh man, to show you how the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity would make believers' hearts his living temple and make his abode in all those that tremble at his word. The apostle more particularly alludes to this in the words immediately following our main text. For having called the Corinthians the temple of the living God, he adds, As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. These are strange and strong expressions. But strange and strong as they are, they are experienced by all who are indeed the temples of the living God. For they are said to be chosen by, to be a holy habitation through the Spirit, to dwell in God and God in them, to have the witness in themselves, and to have God's Spirit witnessing with their spirits that they are the children of God. This is the sentiment that our Lord expressed when he prayed for his church and people just before his bitter passion, saying that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. We experience this oneness in the church when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, during the invocation, and during the benediction. If you have eyes that see or ears that hear, you will notice it in almost every aspect of the public worship of Almighty God. This doctrine is not new, nor is it the per peculiar opinion of any particular Christian denomination. Rather, these are words of truth and soberness common to the beliefs of all sincere Christians, however dif differing in other respects. It is time for me, secondly, to make some practical application of our text. You have heard in what sense it is that real Christians are the temple of the living God. Do you believe these things? If so, I congratulate you from my inmost soul. Oh, that your hearts may be in tune this day to magnify the Lord, and your spirits prepared to rejoice in God your Savior. Like the Virgin Mary, you are highly favored, and all the generations of God's people shall call you blessed. You can call Christ Lord by the Holy Ghost, and thereby have internal as well as external evidence of the divinity, both of his person and of his holy word. You have found the second Adam to be a quickening spirit. He has raised you from death to life. And being thus taught and born of God, however unlearned you are in other respects, you can say, is this not the Christ? What a privilege this is. God's Spirit witnesses with your spirit that you are a child of God. When you think of this, are you not ready to cry out with a beloved disciple, what manner of love is this, that we should be called the children of God? For he has sealed you for the day of redemption and has given you the earnest of your future inheritance. His eyes and heart shall therefore be upon you continually, and in spite of all opposition from men and devils, the capstone of this spiritual building shall be brought forth. Your body shall be fashioned like our Redeemer's glorious body, and your soul, in which he now delights to dwell, shall be filled with all the fullness of God. Dearly beloved in the Lord, what say you to these things? Do your hearts not burn within you when you think of these deep and glorious truths of God? What shall we render to the Lord for all these mercies? Surely he has done great things for us, how great is his goodness and his bounty. Oh, the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love of God. Surely it passes all knowledge. Oh, for a humility and a soul-abasing, God-exalting sense of these things. When the great Jehovah filled the first temple with his glory, King Solomon burst forth into this heartfelt exclamation, But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? With how much greater astonishment ought we to say, will the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity dwell in and make our earthly hearts his living temples? And yet he will. My brethren, why is this? 
from any fitness foreseen in us? No, I know you reject such an unbecoming thought. Was it then from the application of our own free will? No, I am persuaded you will not thus debase the riches of God's free grace. Are you not ready to say, not unto us, not unto us, but unto your free, unmerited, sovereign love and mercy, O Lord, be all the glory? It is this, and this alone, that has made the difference between us and others. We have nothing but what is freely given us from above. If we love God, it is because God first loved us. Let us study and strive to walk as becomes those who are made temples of the living God, or as the apostle elsewhere expresses himself, a holy temple unto the Lord. How holily and purely we should live. As our apostle argues in another place, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? <clears throat> or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Shall those who are temples of the living God allow themselves to be dens of thieves and cages of unclean birds? Shall vain and unchaste thoughts be allowed to dwell within them? Much less should anything that is impure be conceived or acted on by them. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? God forbid. We all know with what a distinguished ardor our blessed Redeemer purged an earthly temple. A zeal for his father's house consumed him. With a holy vehemence, he overturned the tables of the money changers and scourged the buyers and sellers out before him. Why? They made his father's house a house of merchandise. They had turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves. Oh, my brethren, how often have you and I been guilty of this great evil? How often have the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eye, and the pride of life insensibly stolen away our hearts from God? Once they were indeed houses of prayer, faith, hope, love, peace, joy, and all the other fruits of the blessed spirit lodged within them, but now it may be thieves and robbers. Hence those hidings of God's face, that dryness and barrenness of soul, those wearisome nights and days which many of us have felt from time to time. Hence those painful and heartbreaking complaints, Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Oh, that it was with me as in the days of old, when the candle of the Lord shone bright upon my soul. Hence those domestic trials, those personal losses and disappointments. These are only scourges from small cords in the loving Redeemer's hand to scourge the buyers and sellers out of the temple of our hearts. But who is worthy to do this thing? None but the Lord alone, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Therefore, let him cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of his blessed spirit, that henceforth we may more perfectly love him and more worthily magnify his holy name. There may be those among you who fear that the Lord has forgotten you because of your sins, that his loving kindness has been replaced by displeasure, and that he will no longer hear your prayers. O oh, dejected, despondent souls, take comfort from the word of the Lord and call to mind his wonderful declarations of old to his people. I am he who blots out your transgressions, Isaiah 43:25. For a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. Isaiah 54, 7. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Isaiah 49, 15. For as a father pities his own children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. Think of these words. Then you shall find by happy experience that the Lord your God, gracious and merciful, is indeed slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relates over disaster, relents over disaster. Who knows, but he may come down this day, this hour, even this moment, and suddenly revisit the temple of your hearts. Who knows, but he may revive his work in your precious souls, causing you to return to your first love, help you to do your first works, and even exceed your hopes and cause the glory of the second visitation, even to surpass that glory which filled your hearts in that happy day, 
in which he first redeemed you and made you his living temples. But the application of our subject must not end here. What of those of you who cannot yet say that you are the temple of the living God? Allow me to speak plainly to you, my brethren, for you have heard what has been said in the words of our text and what must be wrought within us before we can truly say that we are the temple of the living God. Is it so with you? Are you separated from the world and from worldly attitudes? Have your hearts become houses of prayer? Does the Spirit of God dwell in your souls? And, whatever, and whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do you do all for the glory of God? These are simple yet very important questions. What answer can you give to them? Perhaps you say, we have been dedicated to God in baptism. We go to church. We say our prayers, repeat our creeds, and have subscribed to the confessions of faith. We do nobody, no, nobody any harm. We are honest, moral people. We are church members. We keep up family prayer and constantly go to the table of the Lord. All these things are good. But this far may you go, and even farther, and still be far from the kingdom of God. The unprofitable servant did no one any harm, and the foolish virgins had the lamp of an outward profession and went up even to heaven's gate calling Christ Lord, Lord. Alas, one thing you yet lack, the one chief thing without which all is nothing. I mean the indwelling of God's blessed spirit, without which you can never become the temples of the living God. Awake, therefore, you deceived formalists, Awake, who vainly puffed up with your model of performances, boastingly cry out, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord we are. Awake, you outward-only worshippers. You are building on a sandy foundation. Take heed, yes, you, lest you also go to hell by the very door of heaven. As for you who have done none of these things, who instead of making an outward profession of religion, proclaim your sin like Sodom and willfully and daringly live a life without God. I ask you, how can you think to escape if you persist in neglecting such a great salvation? I should utterly despair of your ever, dis uh, ever attaining the blessed privilege of being the temples of the living God had I not heard of thousands who through the grace of God have been translated from a similar state of darkness into his marvelous light. Such, says the Apostle Paul, were some of these very Corinthians who were now God's living temples. They were formerly drunkards, whoremongers, adulterers, and the like. In 1 Corinthians 5.11, the Apostle says, Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, that the same blessed Spirit may come this day and pluck those of you with no outward religion as brands out of the burning fire. Behold, I warn you to flee from the wrath to come. Go home and meditate on these things and think whether it is not infinitely better, even in this life, to be temples of the living God rather than to be slaves to every brutish lust, and to be led captive by the devil at his will. The Lord Jesus can set your souls free, and if you fly to him for refuge, he will. He has led captivity captive. He has, he has ascended up on high to give this gift of the blessed Spirit of God for men, even for the rebellious, that he may dwell in your hearts by faith here, and thereby prepare you to dwell with him and all the heavenly host in his kingdom hereafter. May God in his infinite mercy grant that this may be the happy lot of you all, for the sake of his dear Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with the Father and the Holy Spirit, three persons, but one God, be ascribed all power, might, majesty, and dominion, now and forevermore. Amen and Amen.